Elaine Klamasco is a violinist and well-known teacher. She was the youngest member to join the newly formed National Arts Centre Orchestra of Canada in 1969. And in this conversation, we talk about those early years, and she shares stories about some of her teachers, including Laurent Fenivesh and Joseph Gingold. In 2003, Pinka Sugerman asked Elaine to launch the first Junior Young Artists Program for the NAC Summer Music Institute, and she speaks about some of her experiences teaching there, as well as advice for aspiring young players aiming to become soloists or professional orchestra players. I've added timestamps in the description, and all of these episodes are available in both podcast and video format. The link is in the description as well. Good morning, Elaine Klamasco. Thanks for joining me. Good morning, Leah. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this. So you were a founding member of a very unusual orchestra. In 1969 was the first concert of the National Arts Centre Orchestra and I've been a member for many years. But the thing is, I grew up in Ottawa going to those concerts and being so inspired. So I knew when I was eight, I wanted to be a professional violinist, but I wanted to be on that stage with the orchestra, playing in the orchestra. That was my ambition because it was such a, a wonderful model. So tell me what those early days were like. I'm really pretty fascinated, just the way the rehearsals were, the audition process. It was very different. Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, I certainly didn't expect that because I hadn't even started university yet. I was just 18. And um, my teacher, who was Laurent Fenivish, um, a great, great teacher, Israeli, um, and has produced so many fantastic students over the decades for sure, he, he suggested strongly that I come to Ottawa to do this audition. And um, actually, it was Montreal, pardon me. It, the uh, auditions were in Montreal. So off I went. And um, you know, I had to get up at eight o'clock in the morning. I had to, the edition started at 8 a.m. and being still somewhat of a teenager, that was kind of early, but I managed and um, I got into this building and uh, there in about the fifth or sixth row were 10 to 15 men in dark suits staring at me, not, not a suggestion of a smile, very polite, but very formal. And, you know, in those days, I guess I had um, a little more What's pa than I do now in the sense of, well, if you don't like the way I look, or if you don't want to hear me play, that's okay, I'm going to play anyway. <laughs> but it certainly wasn't a friendly environment. And I think that's just the way things were done then. So I, I started to play and um, I have fortunately through most of my life not suffered from nerves in performance. So I, I think I played well and I did get the job. And there I came, uh, 19 years of age, 1960. 79, was it? 69, I can't remember. Six, 69, yeah. 69, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What did you play for the audition? Was it excerpts or a concerto? Oh, my goodness. I didn't think I was going to ask this question. <laughs> I'm sure I played a concerto and I probably played the Brook D minor because that's what I was sort of working on with him last. Mm -hmm. And I, I know they did ask for a few different movements. And yes, there were excerpts. But, you know, Mr. Fanivish had been, um, you know, a member of fine orchestras all his life and everything. So, um, he, he knew the excerpts inside out and actually it was a blessing to have someone like him um, help me to to learn those because it was a first hand first hand introduction to all those great works I had I didn't eat, I hadn't even played in a in a um, youth orchestra because there wasn't one I played mm -hmm. in um, a, a string orchestra with John Scholick my teacher at the mm -hmm. University of Toronto but so it was all new to me there was a fair bit of practicing to do and a lot of listening on recordings to make sure I knew Tempe and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I understand there were so many more rehearsals for each concert back in the day. Oh my goodness, I think I had everything memorized. I'm not, I have terrible memory for many things, but not for music. And I think I had everything memorized by halfway through the second rehearsal. It was just, I guess they just wanted to give us a great deal of time to be sure that, you know, we were comfortable as an ensemble, that we were comfortable with the maestro Bernardi wanted to do blah 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 and uh, that's that's just the way it was but you know I mean of course the repertoire was new to me I mean I remember one of the first pieces was the Pavlov of classical symphony and that's a bit of a dance up and down the fingerboard it's not easy and um, uh, you know it did take some work to put it together for sure but the musicians were terrific Walter was a great concert master he was um, very supportive of me very um, um, father-like in a way in the beginning just always uh, telling me that you know his door was opened if I needed any advice or anything like that and I I mean there were other young people but I think I was the youngest so it was it was 
quite an experience just even getting to rehearsal on time and everything. I had never had that rigid a schedule, you know, mm -hmm. what it's like when you're a student. So, but, but it was good fun. But most of the orchestra was in their 20s, right? Like it was very young. Yeah, it was a young, it was a young orchestra indeed. Yeah. And so yeah. before, before talking to you, I actually took the time to read uh, Sarah Jennings' Art in Politics, the History of the National Arts Center, because I've had that on my shelf all these years and I've been meaning to read it and I wanted to um, read it. And there's a quote in there where uh, Mario Bernardi, had, who was the um, music director, founding conductor, had said, let me get this right. He said he wanted to hire young musicians who would not become jaded by too much professional experience, which I found very <laughs> offensive. <laughs> As, but I think a lot of conductors think that way, which, you know, I, I hope it's not true for, you know, the more experience you have, I think, I don't know. What do you think about that statement? Well, I mean, it certainly wasn't applicable to somebody my age. I was at that stage where you do as you're told, you know, still, <laughs> still like being at home or whatever. And, and so, you know, the maestro said, you know, sit up well he didn't say sit up straight but if he said you know play that again in a different part of the bow I mean I I paid attention there were always a couple of cynical players I remember in the very beginning I won't suggest any names but somebody came sauntering in about 15 minutes after the rehearsal started and of course the whole orchestra stopped because he he was making a bit of a ruckus just positioning himself and everything else and uh and uh, the conductor turned to him and said, you're really quite late and this is very disruptive. And he just looked at him and he said, you should be very thankful that I'm here when I am. <laughs> <laughs> so it took all types. It took all types that we, we were an interesting group of people. And um, I was very fortunate to have a, a wonderful friend from the very beginning who's 10 years my senior, Jerry Chapa. She wasn't, it wasn't like a motherly figure. It was just like an older sister, I would mm -hmm. say. And she was, we are still the very best of friends to this day and we had a long talk just yesterday and we love each other as family and she she was very helpful in making me shall i say wise to <laughs> certain things like she was a little protective of me leah but in a in a very positive way because you know there are always a few bullies around and she just was able to sort of show me and help me to get how to handle people that were you know a little sarcastic to me or whatever there wasn't a lot of that but there certainly was a tiny bit. I mean, when I first got here, um, I was put in a pretty high position and in, in, uh, put onto the third stand and that created a lot of unhappiness with colleagues behind me <laughs> who were older and much more experienced, but it was what it was. I didn't ask for that. That's where they put me. So what was I to do? And I think that in all fairness, the reason they put me there was they thought I had talent, but they, want, they put me with somebody they felt was very experienced. And that was Joan Milkson because she was older and, and wiser and had, had a lot more orchestral experience, been at Juilliard, all those things. And it was actually, I, I enjoyed sitting with her. We had, we became good friends. It was lovely. Mm -hmm. You mentioned John Moskalik. He was your major uh, teacher when you were growing up. And I understand he died very suddenly when you were 14. Oh, it was horrible. And one of the worst parts of it was I was um, a Canadian representative at the International Congress of Strings at Michigan State University. I don't know if you were familiar with that program, but it was a fantastic program. They got they brought students from every state and every province in Canada mm -hmm. for eight weeks at Michigan State University. And the teachers were people like Joseph Gingold. I mean, <laughs> they were amazing teachers there. And uh, I, I had that opportunity. And while I was there, I got a call from my father saying that he was died very suddenly. He was a very heavy smoker. And that probably was part of what happened. But I think, I can't remember, I think he was maybe 44 or something like mm -hmm. that. And, but a terrible loss to the, to the music world. I mean, great, great teacher. I don't know too much about his performing performing life. If he, I think he might have been in the Toronto Symphony for a while, but his his niche and his um, special talents certainly were with teaching, and he had a lot of really fine students and dedicated students. I, I loved him dearly, and I still think of him often. I've decided to insert a little footnote here about John Muscolic. Since I did this interview with Elaine, I discovered that John Muscolic tragically lost his job with the Toronto Symphony as one of the Symphony Six in 1951. He and his colleagues were denied entry to the United States when the Toronto Symphony was going to perform one concert there because they were suspected of being involved in communist activities during the terrible McCarthy era. The symphony terminated their contracts. John Muscolic had joined the symphony in 1946 when he was 26 years old. One of the reasons he may have been targeted 
was that he had conducted the Budapest Orchestra for two performances in 1949. One of John's most famous students was Stephen Stark, also a Ukrainian-Canadian, who was one of the Symphony Six to lose his job as well. Stark went on to become concertmaster of many prominent orchestras, including the Chicago Symphony, before returning to the Toronto Symphony as concertmaster many years later. Stark studied with John Moskalik as his first teacher in 1938 until 1942. After losing his job with the Toronto Symphony, John Moskalik joined the faculty at University of Toronto and the Royal Conservatory of Music. He was born in 1918 and died in 1966 when he was 48 years old. Did he have studio classes, like master classes with? No, he, he didn't. Leah, that is something that came a little bit later, perhaps in universities, that was always the case. But mm -hmm. the other thing to remember is that I lived in Hamilton, Ontario. Mm -hmm. So every Saturday, my poor father, I mean, I have sisters who were also violinists and we were all on a full special string scholarship, all four of us. So we got in the car at the crack of dawn. I just hated it. And <laughs> we, we'd fight in the back seat, you know, <laughs> do that long drive to Toronto and, um, and then the lessons would start. But after, after the lessons, we did do a little bit of, uh, there was a little chamber thing. I just had re recalled that now. Yeah, we did. It wasn't a full size. It was just like a chamber orchestra. Were strength, you waiting? Were you waiting for your sisters? Did they study with the same teacher? Oh, yes, yes, they were. <laughs> and my, my, my father, God bless him, he, uh, he sat there writing copious notes, which of course we never read. I mean, I do have one very funny story about that, those trips to Toronto on, on one occasion, my older sister, um, it was her turn for, I guess she was having her lesson first or whatever, when she opened her violin case, it was full of comic books instead of her violin. <laughs> Thomas Gallick just had a very good chuckle. He laughed. He, he wasn't cross with her at all. It was just kind of funny. <laughs> so was there kind of a competitiveness among the siblings because you're all doing the same thing? Um, my father did some very strange things. Like in festival, he sometimes put us in against each other. And mm -hmm. he, he just didn't think of it as a negative thing. It was, I guess, just a more competitive in a way kind of world that like music festivals were a huge huge thing hmm. um i mean and we didn't just play in the hamilton kiwanis we played in the toronto kiwanis the hamilton kiwanis the um uh, oh, i just got to say st catherine's kiwanis the guelph kiwanis i mean i just i just was festivaled out by the time i was 10 mm -hmm. but uh, and it wasn't necessarily all the same repertoire when i think about the repertoire I went through in those young years and some of my students who complained that oh I that's too much for me to learn I think oh boy <laughs> you should see what I had to do <laughs> that, must have, that, that must have helped you with nerves because you're saying you didn't develop stage fright so maybe all that performing when you're young helped I had no stage fright but it did hit me and very severely at one point but mm -hmm. many many years later when I was a member of the National Art Center Orchestra mm -hmm. I like to talk about this 3D because I think it's very important for the world to hear this and to understand because I, I'm sometimes referred to as a kind of natural violinist whatever that means but and I guess I don't show a kind of um, uh, fear on stage or I, I don't get particularly quiet before a performance or whatever things that, that, that happen to people but Leia it was um it was just interesting I don't I don't know I don't, I don't know how to explain this it was um I, I just I just love to play and I because I played a lot, I guess I just felt comfortable with the instrument. But for, for with no indication that anything was going to change or happen, it suddenly did hit me. Oh, I don't remember what year. I probably don't want to remember what year, but it was just almost, it can be an almost paralyzing experience. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sure that most of our colleagues, if they were honest, would admit that they have maybe had at least one episode of that in their lives. It's just, it's just the way it is. <laughs> You know, you're thrown onto a stage with, you know, a thousand plus people staring at you, expecting something very special. And, you know, you're, you're worrying about all kinds of things. It wasn't so much the music I remember I would worry about or memory, because those things were easy for me. I was such a seasoned player because I started so young. I was three. It was, um, it was, I don't know, just, I can't even explain what it was, what, what caused those nerves to suddenly appear. I guess I just started doubting myself a little bit. Mm -hmm. like what if the what if syndrome you know yeah and we we all we all have that i guess from time 
most most musicians I think experience that if they're going to be honest. I didn't talk about it at all in the beginning because I thought why but now I talk about it all the time and my students just look at me sometimes they hug me after I tell them that story. They just feel so relieved that I too had to deal with that you know. Mm -hmm. Anyway. So um, just to close off with John Mos I'm probably saying his name wrong. Uh, this, this, it's on the second syllable, Muscolic. Muscolic. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, what was he like as a teacher? What did you learn from him? Everything. <laughs> he wasn't, he wasn't um, a really intellectual kind of teacher. I think he, he played in the Toronto Symphony, I believe, if I, my memory doesn't fail me. But um, he went through a lot of repertoire. But mm -hmm. boy, every lesson started with Sepchik. I mean, every single lesson and dare you not have that prepared and then you know the age you'd started with I guess Kreutzer or whatever the stage you were at and, and went up but those were always listened to and I remember on one occasion he asked me to play my age from Kreutzer and I opened the book and it kept shutting because I hadn't practiced it <laughs> the pages kept fluttering and he said I can see you haven't spent due time on this age young lady <laughs> but he was very he was very personal um Every he held a cigarette between his second and third finger through the whole lesson, and and would occasionally take a puff, and the smoke would come, you know, filling into my face. But everybody smoked then, so for some reason it just didn't bother me. But he was very, very kind. He was very ambitious, and he 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 was complimentary. But he but he saved the compliments for for the right time. He he always tried to find a constructive way to. To help you know and he didn't scold I mean unless I didn't practice those subjects <laughs> but but he just tried to find positive ways to to help I mean in retrospect I realized that that he didn't and this is not a criticism because we're all guilty of something as teachers but I wish he had spent a little more time on my bow arm in those formative years mm -hmm. because it, it came back to sort of haunt me a little bit later on and I had a lot of correcting to do which came later with a great teacher but um, you can't address everything. I, I, yeah. I, think at the, I think at the peak, Leia, he had something like 48 students. Wow. It's pretty incredible. But I remember sometimes he would give extra lessons to the Comasco sisters because we were involved in so many performances and music festivals. And we'd, he'd give up his Sundays. We'd drive to his home and um, we'd all have our lessons. And, you know, my dad would be upstairs having coffee and and cake with his uh, after the lessons with him and his wife. We were never invited for that. We were sitting in the car waiting patiently. Things we remember. <laughs> oh, things have changed. Indeed. Yeah, they sure have. I was just thinking for people listening who aren't violinists, uh, Chef Schick wrote a lot of these sort of not not quite etudes. I'd say sort of ex drill exercises, mostly for shifting and also things like trill. So left hand. Would you describe that's I much. think that's a perfect description. Yeah. The only thing you've left out is they're extremely boring. They are. And you know, I had to but do them work. so much. Yeah, you know, so I'm curious if you use them with your students. Because I have avoided Chef Schick because I hated it. But now I'm thinking I, I have to start doing that with my students. Well, it, it's a kind of drill that 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 has success. There's no question. Yeah. But but I think I have to I I think I have to say that that um I you see, I don't teach a lot of I don't teach any beginner students. So, I mean, I have in my life, but, but with those, I probably did do some subject exercises, but I'm a little bit like you. I, I, ATUs are very important to me and I make sure, I mean, with the older students, you know, they're doing the higher end ones, of course, but there always has to be an etude at the beginning of the lesson or a three yeah. octave scale or something, something to that effect. Yeah. But um, it wasn't fun. Yeah. <laughs> First to admit it. And he didn't write one book. He wrote many yeah everything from double stops to whatever but uh, they're really really boring but I guess they worked yeah <laughs> so you, when you went to Laurent Fenivesh how are the lessons different <laughs> well there's a great story about that Barb McDougall um, who's was one of his more senior students she's not that much older than me maybe three four years but um I'll answer your question first the lessons were extremely long he was so dedicated and I did not appreciate it. I just thought, I just want to leave now. Yeah. And he was, uh, his speech, he was brilliant, but a tiny bit, he was very, very soft-spoken. So a tiny bit, shall I say, 
monotonous. I, that sounds so disrespectful. I don't mean that, but it, it, it was hard to, to keep focused. And I was young, I was 12, yeah. you know, and it was maybe I was even younger. So it was hard to keep focused, but I, I tried to, because I mean, I realized he had a great reputation, but the funniest thing about him is he was so incredibly dedicated that sometimes my lessons were three hours long and I didn't appreciate that at the time. I mean, I'm ashamed to even admit that now, but a, a colleague, Barb Nelson McDougall's mother, who also studied with him, came and audited a lesson once with me. And she told me this a number of years ago and I was just mortified, but apparently at one point I turned to him and I said, could you please tell me what time it is? <laughs> I was tired. I mean, just standing there yeah. for three hours. And, he had this sort of monotone voice and um, uh, you know what? I, I didn't deserve him in a way. I didn't appreciate it. He was a little too intellectual for me. And I mean, I think he was just an incredibly intelligent man. And um, I mean, he, the other thing he did that was really sort of fun though, is he did very unusual repertoire. He never, I didn't learn all the famous pieces that everybody else learned. Everything I learned was different. Mm -hmm. And he just he just enjoyed doing that. And in retrospect, I share those kinds of works with my students now, too. I can't even think of an example at the moment, but but, you know, there were many very a wonderful, wonderful man. I obviously learned a great deal from him, but but um, it wasn't my most inspiring teacher. And I, I say that with with reservation because mm -hmm. he was a, truly a great and unselfish man. <laughs> I'm curious about the schedule. I mean, if you had so many students, were they waiting in the hallway while he took an extra two hours with somebody or? Oh, yes. Oh, wow. Oh, yes. Yeah. You <laughs> never knew. And he was never criticized for that because, I mean, it, it just showed incredible dedication. But I mean, he he had no no concept of time, no sense of time whatsoever. It's like he once told me, we were, talk, we were talking about that once in my later years after I'd not, when I was no longer studying with him, he told me once that he was that way with maps. He would pick up a map and his wife, he never learned to drive. He was terrified of driving. Mm -hmm. So his wife did the driving and he would ask her to, you know, use the map. He'd sit there with the map like this and then he'd turn it 90 <laughs> degrees. And then he'd turn it 90 degrees this way. And his wife would just giggle and finally just grab the map from him and go on with her thing. But um, he was really a great man. <laughs> He, he really was a wonderful, wonderful human being. I, I just so wish sometimes that at this stage of my life, I could just have a conversation with him. And mm -hmm. first and foremost, thank him for all he did for me because he's the reason I'm in the National Arts Center Orchestra. I mean, I had to play an addition to get accepted, but he's the one who guided me towards that goal. And uh, I, I just have so many fond memories of the things I learned with him. And and he had a wonderful class of great violinists and Terry Hollowock from Timmins. I, I think he's still in the Toronto Symphony, or at least he was for many years. Things mm -hmm. like that, yeah. I was fortunate. But did you aspire to be a soloist when you were a teenager? Is that what you were working towards? Absolutely. I was going to just take over the world, you know. I just, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, we're so naive at that age. It's just so funny. But I just, I mean, I was always complimented when I played. And so I thought, well, I can do anything I want. And and you know, not having any fears or stage fright or anything like that. And I was, I it can take me a very long time to learn something and some things, but in music, I'm a very, very quick study. <laughs> and I don't know where that comes from and why, because I could be incredibly slow in other things, but I just I, I have the piece memorized before I've gotten to the end of it. You know what I mean? It's just it's just how my brain works, I guess. Well, I know you have perfect pitch. Maybe that helps. Yeah, it's yeah, I don't know what that perfect pitch, you know, I have um, five, I have five sisters and a brother and four of us are violinists and we all have perfect pitch. I wonder where that comes from. I've often wondered about that. Do you have perfect pitch? I do not. And what I find interesting, uh, the majority of my students tend to, but I've been taught, I mostly teach teenagers and they, they've been telling me that they start to lose it as they get older and it gets fuzzy. And what I find fascinating about this is that then they don't have strategies to fall back on like I do because I don't have perfect pitch. I have to rely on listening for intervals and relative pitch, but they aren't used to using oh. strategies. So then they're lost. They don't know how to find the note. So I find that's an interesting discussion to have with them. Very interesting. My goodness, I haven't had that discussion with anybody. I've, I don't even, I mean, I don't have very many students right now at this particular point, but even with the orchestra schedule, I've been 
you know, our schedule's been so busy for some years, and I don't think I ever had more than maybe 10 students, and that was, that was a little bit of a struggle. But I don't know, I just can't see myself going to a conservatory, and I have been asked in the University of Ottawa and things like that, but I don't, don't know if, it's, if that's who I am to just sit in a, in a, you know, four by, not four by four, but a small, small room and just, you know, as they come in one after the other, that doesn't appeal to me for some reason. Yeah, I was curious to ask you about that because we we have power. I'm younger than you, but like we enjoy teaching, but playing in the orchestra is like the majority of our career. Yeah, and I I think like for me it, it helps me be a better player because I'm thinking about how to teach, but I think it makes me a better teacher because I'm performing as well. I agree. I mean, I think I think a student that uh, has the opportunity to study with someone who performs and teaches is a very lucky student because they're seeing all aspects of of a professional life. And mm -hmm. that's something, you know, I've thought about a lot because, you know, there are a lot of teachers out there who don't perform or who quit performing for a variety of reasons. And mm -hmm. I don't know how they can quite prepare those students for what's ahead, you know. I had numerous discussions with Joseph Gingold about this and uh, he, the two of us had a very special relationship because when I went to him, I was 29, I took a sabbatical from the orchestra. I hope I'm not jumping here. I was just, here. no, no, I was going to get to that. It's wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was, it, it was just one of the most magnificent, incredible, special years of my life. And I don't even know, sort of, I, I do know what possessed me to do it. The year, the last year I studied with um, John Muscolic, he had had a talk with me and my father, and he had said that, you know, all his hard work and everything was in preparation for me to study with the great Joseph Gingold. And of course, I never forgot that. I mean, my, my father probably didn't either. But um, anyway, so there I was, and you know, I was with the orchestra and everything. And I thought, well, I'm just going to take a sabbatical. And I mean, it was in, I, I've been in the orchestra for how many years? I'm losing my- 10, I believe. Math, it was 10, yeah. So, so you know, it was, it, it, I just thought it might be sort of interesting. And so off I went and um, he was fantastic to me. And um, I had my lessons at 7.30 in the morning, which I'm a, I'm a very early riser and um, I love the morning more than any part of the day, I think. And uh, he also was an early riser. And um, there was a special court in Indiana in the small town of Bloomington. Well, you went to Bloomington too, did you not? Mm -hmm, yeah, I did. And uh, Maxwell Terrace, I think it was called. And that's where he lived. And he lived in an apartment, sort of, I, I was across the street. And the person in the bottom of my apartment was Bill Prussell and Gwen Starker. And so I, I developed very, very special friendships <laughs> while I was there and met some of the who's who of the music world today. But Mr. Gingold was so special to me, I guess in part because I was a little bit older, but you know, I would, he, he um, lost his dear wife sooner than he should have. And uh, he couldn't fend for himself. I just tell you a funny story about it. He took a vacation once a year and you know what he did? He went about 20 kilometers away to a little town and got a hotel room and sat there and watched soap operas. No. For, for two days and that was his idea of a vacation. Isn't that a wonderful story? So Strange. Then he, well, that's, that's, that's all he wanted to do. He wanted, <laughs> he just, he loved television and he loved cake and pie he loved his sweets and so when I was at Maxwell Terrace and he was across the street I would I would cook for him sometimes and take food so we had a very special relationship because I was a little bit older he told me so many wonderful stories about his life and everything that happened to him in the course of his career and of course that school was full of great people as you know having been there so I got to know Janusz Starker very very well and his daughter and I remain the best of friends to this to this day and um, he, he did, he, I, I went to his master classes all the time. I, I learned so much from Janusz Starker. It doesn't matter if you were a violinist or a cellist, he was, what a, what a brilliant, brilliant mind. I mean, everybody at that school was fantastic. <laughs> I was so lucky to have that opportunity. I just wish I'd had four years there, not just mm -hmm. one. <laughs> what, well, did you consider maybe leaving the orchestra and studying more or was it? No, really? no. no. And for a few reasons, I had a, I had a, very serious boyfriend at home that became my husband <laughs> and he was missing me and he came down mm -hmm. often to visit and everything else but no I, I guess I guess because of the age disparity with myself and the students it was 10 years I guess I just felt that um 
if I did something like that, it, well, it wouldn't be done over Zoom or anything because they didn't have that then. But but I I just I just figured maybe that was enough, and the door was always open for me to return. And I I keep very active Leia as a violinist in in um, helping myself to improve on a shall I say a weekly basis, maybe not a daily basis. But I'm I'm forever reading and um, the uh, uh, the book by. Kalami and the, the Art of Violin playing it. That's a Bible to me. I, it's here in my apartment where I am now. And I, I just read it. It's bloody boring to read, but it makes a lot of sense if you can get past that. If you have any question at all, the answer is in that book. Yeah. yeah. But what did what did you learn with Mr. Gingold in terms of, uh, I don't know, repertoire, pedagogy? Well, um, he had I'll start with pedagogy because he had he had group, group classes like master classes whatever and that I guess was once a week and I went to his and I went to Janusz Starker's and everything else and it was just I mean there was there was there was a lot of repertoire that I was exposed to over that eight nine months because you know his class was large as I said forty some students I think so I, I I learned a lot more repertoire that I never had the chance to learn because I was so young when I started with the orchestra I never went to mm -hmm. university so that was the first thing. Um, uh, he, he was always keen on looking at less, lesser known works too. So there was, there was a little bit of that in, in what I did with him for sure. Um, I don't know. He, you know, he would talk about other students to me in such a wonderful way. He would say, do you like, do you like so-and-so's play? That's what he talked. And I'd say, oh yeah, I think he's very talented. Mr. He said, he's, then he, he, he treated me as, as a um, colleague as more than a student in some ways. And then he would discuss something about that person, particular bow arm, something that was positive or even something that was negative, but in a positive way, he would talk about it because he knew that my passion was teaching. And that was something that I wanted to be the very best I could at, because it's really hard to teach a good bow arm. I don't know how you feel about that, but yeah, I mean, there are so many things that come into it. I mean, you know, when you, person picks up the violin it's just this sort of rigid this is rigidity because it's awkward I mean playing with jello is much more natural I think mm -hmm. <laughs> but I I'm still learning yeah and thank goodness <laughs> so in in your own teaching do you have it must have evolved over the years but do you have like a system like a progression of concertos or certain ways you structure goals for your students not at all <laughs> and maybe maybe that's a mistake um, but I've never, I've never done that. Well, I'll start by saying that, you know, with my students all being a little bit more senior, I don't really teach the sites concertos. I, they're gorgeous and I played them all, but I'm, I'm at a slightly higher level than that with the students that come to me. So um, I, what I do is I, the repertoire I haven't learned, I try to learn. You know, I have the concerto according to Pecos and I've studied that very carefully over the years um, because Everybody wants to play like Pincus <laughs> and, uh, you know, looking at his fingerings and things like that. And no, it, it just, I mean, sometimes a student will come to me and I'm a little bit unusual as a teacher this way. And they'll say, I really, really want to play the Tchaikovsky violin concerto. You know, they can hardly play Come to Jesus and Whole Notes. So <laughs> when I have a student like that, sometimes I, I'll just give them an excerpt, you know, and, but something that's challenging because when you get to those Gavigny etudes and and past, you know, the Paganini caprices and stuff. Some of those things are really hard. So yeah, I'll just, it, it, it's, it's, it suffices. It makes them happy to just have learned four lines of something. Mm -hmm. And then when they're ready, you know, we'll, we'll go on and do more. Mm -hmm. So like um, you mentioned participating in festivals a lot when you were young, what, it, so I, I feel like it's really changed. Like not that many students enter their students in festivals. Like it's kind of dried up almost the interest in that. Well, and I, I don't, I don't know why. Um, I, I feel really saddened about that because I think that's what gave me. Um, I mean, hopefully there was some talent there too, but I think that's what gave me the experience of performing um, as much as I did and my confidence in performing. I mean, Leah, I, I would, I would play in um, Ottawa, St. Catharines, Guelph. I mean, maybe six. Toronto was the big one, and. Um, and not necessarily the same repertoire at all. When I think about the repertoire that Mr. Mascala gave me through Emmy, it was it was phenomenal. I I was I was a quick learner, fortunately, and, and fast quick. Well, I mean, I, I 
it wasn't a struggle for me to do that kind of thing. And I, I had a little more confidence than I deserved maybe <laughs> too. So I was able to learn some of those things quickly, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's, those things have changed and I'm, I'm so sad about it because um, even the Qantas Festival here, Music Festival, I'm a huge advocate of it. I always put my students into it. I mean, it's been very strange for the last two years for sure, but um, th that's, not a, that's not an option. You go there and you play. And I mean, I let them have some choice, but I, I really try to make every student play in at least four classes. And um, we used to have, I don't know if you had the same thing, we used to have sight reading classes too. Mm -hmm. And do they still have that here? I don't even know. It used to be a requirement, like if you wanted to be eligible for a trophy, you had to have, but I think they got rid of that. You wow. had to do either quick study or sight reading, I think. I think quick study was a wonderful idea that festivals incorporated. I think that's great. You know, when you have mm -hmm. 24 hours or 48, whatever it was yeah. to, to learn something. That's, that's a very good experience for a student in comparison for the professional world. When a conductor comes in and suddenly decides to change their repertoire from, uh, you know, whatever, just to whatever, and you're scrambling yeah. because you haven't played it before. <laughs> and you've been an adjudicator as well. I have. What's what I love it. like? Yeah. Oh, I just love doing that. I haven't been asked for a while. I don't know, maybe because I didn't do a good job or something. But I think the, the life of the festival is is dying. It's uh, my sister, Sonia's still doing well in recent past, not maybe in the recent past, but she has done a little bit more than me. But I I so enjoyed, enjoyed that experience. And um, I, I think it's really great. I look at what we do is a very competitive world. So you know, to have 10 kids stand up and all play the same piece. I don't think that's mean. Mm -hmm. I think it's, I think it's, it's good training, you know, for, because there are always times when we have to learn something in the spur of the moment or whatever. And, and, you know, show the stretcher, stretchers, whatever, and you show that you have something special and, you know, it's just, but then that gets into very long subject matter about, you know, what happens to people when they perform. Some people just clam up and I have had students like that who I've encouraged to pursue music as a hobby mm -hmm. and as an aside when I just see that the personality is not there they don't have that capacity to when I say share in their music making I mean that with kindness but you know you understand what I'm saying it's it's yeah. just some people just just aren't born to do that I think it's unusual though because uh, probably the majority or a large number of your students over the years have gone on to music professionally and do you incur, like do you purposely uh, talk to them about it? The different options as they're growing up. I sure do. At last count, thirty-five are professional musicians now, mm -hmm. all over the world, and I'm very proud of that number. If for no other reason that I did something that I taught them to love something as I love, as I love mm -hmm. it, you know. And for me, happiness is a lot more than important than success. <laughs> and those people seem to really love what they do. So. Um, yeah, that's 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 how I think about it. So I'm just curious because I, it's such a competitive profession as you're saying. It's hard to make a living, and it can be very expensive. The training and all that, buying instruments. So I I've never ever push it, you know. And no one ever asks me should I go into music. So I don't mention it. And they, my students, become lawyers and doctors, and hopefully some of them keep playing. I know some of them do. So I'm just curious. I, I've been thinking maybe I should start talking to them. Like these are your possibilities. If you get serious. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm facing that in a very personal way right now because I have a son who was a bit of a late bloomer in terms of the cello, but he's turned into quite a wonderful young cellist. And um, he wants more than anything to start the addition circuit. And, and mm -hmm. I mean, he's certainly good enough to play in a good orchestra. And <laughs> it's the, the mother in me is sort of saying, but it's not so easy. It's, I mean, there just aren't enough jobs out there. Yeah. So I, yes, I always, I always say that to students. I, I, I don't know what, why this is, but the majority of my students are very good at lots of other things too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure that I was at that age, but a lot of them, I mean, academically, I was never like really, really strong. And I, I think they mark easier now. I'm convinced of that because nowadays all my students have 95%. And in my day, if you had 80%, you were in a very small minority in high school. And I'm, I'm, I mean, 70% was considered a decent average in my time in mm -hmm. high school. Not the best, but decent. So it's difficult to say, Leah. I think, um, I, I don't know about encouraging them to go, to go on. 
I, I never, I never ever want to squelch any dreams, but, but when you have a student who, you know, has achieved what they've achieved because they've just put it in an inordinate amount of hard work. I do talk to them. I try to be as kind as I can, but I, I just, I talk about the competitiveness and about, and I talk a lot about the disappointment. And I said, you know, it, it, hard, hard work doesn't equal a great job. It should, but that's not the way it works in the music world. And I said, you know, it's, it's not person that, it's just, you know, to be able to produce those beautiful sounds in that moment and to sustain it. And I said, it's, a lot of people can't do that you know, for a variety of reasons. So I, most of my students end up going into music. I have to say, I don't have a lot of students. So, but have I ever discouraged a student from going into music? Yes, but not, not in a blatant way at all because I didn't want to hurt their feelings. It's happened a couple of times to me mm -hmm. where I knew they probably would not succeed. But it's, it's much worse now than it was 10 years ago mm -hmm. and even worse than it was 20 years ago. So, I mean, what, what are we to tell our students? I mean, you, the love of I mean, life without music, it's a pretty horrible life. So, I, I mean, sometimes when students say to me, well, if I can't get into, if I can't be a soloist, and of course, most of them say they're going to be a soloist. They just <laughs> believe that. And I don't, I don't squelch that dream. I just say, well, you just keep working hard and we'll see how, how your life unfolds. Mm -hmm. And you just work hard and be a good colleague and be honest and, Let's see what happens. But I, I, say, I do say to all of my students though, if you think that playing in a symphony orchestra is secondary, that's the worst thing you could be thinking because the joy of orchestral playing, and I'm sure you feel the same way, Leah, is there's nothing in life to me that compares with that. When you're playing one of those grand symphonies and you know that build up to the crescendo and you hear the horns of the French word, I mean, I'm just covered in goosebumps. It's, in my 70s still. And I, I, I don't know of any other profession that makes you feel that way. Maybe a doctor delivering a baby. I don't know. <laughs> but it's pretty special. Mm -hmm. so, we'll see. And you coach people doing auditions as well. A lot, um, yeah. Yeah. And what kind of advice do you find yourself giving to them over and over again? Well, the first thing I say is just make sure you're bloody well prepared. <laughs> I mean, because because I, I use this analogy sometimes and it's probably a gross exaggeration, but it scares them enough to work. And I say that with all the hard work you put in, there's a possibility that 50% of it will be lost when you get into the addition room. Mm -hmm. So think of, think of it as having to give 150% of yourself. And they kind of look at me like I'm really weird. <laughs> and, um, but, but it's true. You, just, you never know what's going to happen. There are the, the rare ones who come in who, who just feel at ease and, but you know, the number of auditions I've done for the National Arts Center Orchestra and everything else. And, and knowing some of those people now, it's all behind a screen, but later on finding out who that person was behind the screen and everything else. And I, I've heard, heard people just completely, completely fall apart in an audition. Mm -hmm. And then people say, well, how can I avoid that? I don't want to fall apart. And I just say, well, the words of advice that I got from my teachers as in Joseph Gingold and Laurent Fanevich was, preparation, preparation, preparation. And they said it repeatedly. And they said, you leave no room for error. Now that means different things to different people for sure. But, you know, a person who's a quick learner, and there are many of those in our orchestra, you know, they could maybe think, well, this is good enough. But, you know, maybe, maybe they had a scare in the car on their way to the addition. It, these extenuating circumstances that could certainly mess things up in that moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I was thinking, you know, Mr. Gingold wrote those excerpt books that were still like the standard um, amazing compilations. He was a concert master, right? Before he began. Yes. In Cleveland, mm -hmm. of Cleveland. Yeah. And how lucky they were. <laughs> did, this, did he coach excerpts though? I was curious with his students. Um, that's a good question, Leia. I certainly didn't um, ever attend a class. We had regular master classes. And um, I did not take excerpts to him because that wasn't what yeah. I was there for. But I don't think so. I seem to remember that Janusz Starker did that though in mm. Indiana, but I'll find out for you. I'm kind of curious. I don't think he did that, but how, who better to learn orchestral excerpts from than him? <laughs> yeah. I mean, Mr. Gingle too, just you know, with all those years in the Cleveland Orchestra. 
I mean, he, how lucky they were to have him. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So I mentioned earlier that I'd read this book, um, Art and Politics, and it, they were talking about when they, the concept of the Art Center became, um, when they're developing it, they hired these different consultants. So Louis Applebaum was one of them. And he said he really thought it was important that the orchestra not just be a performance, well, that the building would be connected with the schools and the universities. And it's interesting because I think it took a while for that to happen, but now that's more the, like the education departments become a lot bigger and we have a lot more of that. And you've been quite involved with that. I was curious your perspective on that because I know some colleagues feel like, no, we're performers. That's what it's about. When we go on tour, it shouldn't be so much education all the time. Oh, I couldn't disagree more. Yeah. <laughs> Even if you don't think that you have the innate ability to be a fine teacher, if you've got into the National Arts Center Orchestra, you have a lot to show the world. <laughs> and I mean, we all show it in different ways. And some people are more um, uh, personable in, in those kinds of sessions and and some people do better than others, but I mean, I've I've seen master classes with some people. I'm not going to mention any names. Where you know, I was ready to take a nap after the first three minutes because there was just no excitement in the voice. There was no um, enthusiasm, and for me, that's really important when you're working with students to do that. So going back to the beginning of the orchestra and everything else, and um, you're right. There was there was not any any real association with the University of Ottawa at all. It was, it was actually a very unfortunate thing, I think, because the two go hand in hand, don't they? Mm -hmm. But we did have the hugely successful Young Artist Program with Pincus. Mm -hmm. And as you're probably aware, I, I taught the younger ones. And those were, <laughs> those were magical days in my life. I mean, they came to that program because they saw the name Pincus Sukerman, not because they saw the name Elaine Clamasco. So, I got all the benefits of being just a musician and a violinist be because I was under the umbrella of his name. Mm -hmm. But the people that came to that program, and I'm so happy to say that many decades later now, I am still quite close to the majority of those people. We've kept in contact. I know where many of them are now, what they're doing. I mean, the majority of them certainly did go into music, but I mean, it was the it was the cream of the crop. I can't remember if it was all audition process. I should remember that, but I can't. I guess they did have to audition for me, and then and then they came. But I they came from all over Canada, so I met a lot of really interesting people that I never would have met otherwise. And you know, across across the land, we have we have fabulous teachers. Um, Calgary is a huge musical center, as you know, mm -hmm. um, and you know a lot of very fine students come out of there for sure. It was and a, a lot three of Mm -hmm. It was a three-week program, right? So it was chamber music, master classes, lessons. That's right. That's right. There was a huge emphasis on, um, um, it wasn't just Canadian, so because I just remembered you saying that um, your last comment just uh, jarred my memory about something. There was a girl I had that came from California. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> this is a great story. This will relate, relate to anybody unless they're a violinist and played the Barber Violin Concerto. But um, she came to me in tears and said, Miss um, Camasco, she said, I, I just, she, she was a fantastic young violinist. She was 14 or 15. And she won some huge co concerto competition in the States. And she came to me sobbing one day and I said, what's wrong? And she said, well, I just got an email saying that um, when I play the Barber concerto, I thought I was just gonna play the first movement. I have to play the whole concerto. So she said, how can I learn that last movement in that time? And I said, I know exactly how to teach you to learn that last movement in time. Leia, without a word of a lie, she came to me the next morning and played it for me. She stayed up all night. Oh. <laughs> ba, 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 da, da, da. So she went da, 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 da to the fourth note. Then she went da, 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 da to the seventh note. Yeah. And whatever. And she learned it. I mean, her name was Amy C. And she was a remarkable, remarkable young young woman <laughs> and violinist but but she did it she did it yeah yeah for those people that aren't violinists so that uh, is such a beautiful concerto and the first movement is very lyrical and not as hard technically I would say as other concertos at that level but I think the last movement if I remember the person it was dedicated to might have asked for a different last movement I might be misremembering this and then he went and wrote this incredibly hard last movement I should check that 
I'm going to check so, it too because yeah. I'm interested now. But but for anybody who's listening, teachers or students, if you want to your heart to soar, get the Barbara Violin Concerto because it's so gorgeous and it's it's very doable. I mean, it has a few a few things, but it's just one of those pieces, in my opinion, that helps you to really grow musically as a violinist because if, if you play it in sort of a flat way and you don't let your heart soar with what you're doing with your hands it's not going to be successful but it, it's holly he was a hollywood composer was he not mm -hmm. and i mean it, it's like a movie from hollywood it's it's yeah. pretty it's pretty exciting <laughs> but the last movement's just a moto perpetuo of just constant 16th notes and and, yeah. and don't stop how many is it four pages or six i can't remember now something like but, that um, but i but I, I i sometimes just i i remember even at the app program i i would challenge students with that too just they those kids were also amazing and so hard working that they love those kinds of challenges so sometimes i would say to them okay let's have a master class on the last moon with barbara mm -hmm. <laughs> gosh i miss those days i just wish those days could come back and was, and the master classes with pincus what what were they like It depended on the day. <laughs> I mean, he is unquestionably one of the great musicians of this century, if not the greatest. I mean, there's there's only one pink azuka, and that's for sure. But he gets tired like everybody else, and I mean, there and he he gets impatient if like like everybody else once again if if somebody hasn't worked hard or whatever. I think his pairing with Patty Kopeg was a brilliant one, and she's the one who taught his the senior students i taught the the juniors but they were all very senior in, in level mm -hmm. but, but they were younger and uh, she she could sort of do more than eddie gritty because he's he, he, i don't even know if he's terribly good at it. he'll just i sat in so many of his master classes just wanting to i don't know if i wanted to teach like him i think more i wanted to play like him mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know he he, he would talk about the bow arm or something but everything was just so very natural to him that sometimes it's hard to explain i think that's why he had patty because he was able to mm -hmm. put it into words but with him it was just well why can't you do this <laughs> it's easy yeah. you know, back and forth <laughs> mm -hmm. so we performed um he was our music director for i think about 20 years for the, those people who don't know and we toured with him performing uh, concertos all over the world do you have any special memories of some of those oh, performances? Indeed, in, indeed i do <laughs> maybe it's the same as your memory we were in germany and um in the front row he was playing beethoven concerto and in the front row there were two two boys when i say boys young men they were probably somewhere between around 20 obviously violin players and just so excited to be so close <laughs> To, to him um, in physical distance. And they had the score there, their parts, and they were sort of elbowing each other in anticipation of what this was gonna be like and everything. <laughs> and Pekka started to play, and you and I know how he played the Beethoven Violin Concerto. And this one boy, after, oh, maybe five minutes, the, the score just sort of, and all the intellectual input just sort of dropped to his lap. And he just looked up at him and the tears were just streaming down his face. I'll never forget that as long as I live. He he wasn't making huge sobs. It was just how how Pengus touched people, touches people with this profound with this profound musicianship. Was that um, the first first tour with him, or the one uh, in around two thousand one? It was the one in two thousand, I think. Yeah, I missed that one. I was home with our toddler. <laughs> oh, okay. Tour. Yeah. Well, every performance he gave was, I mean, they, they were always incredible. I, I don't ever remember a bad one. Then remember he used to, he'd play an encore and he grabbed grab somebody's violin from the orchestra, <laughs> played the encore on a violin he never even played before. He's such an amazing natural man with, with that violin under his chin, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. But yeah, Leia, they, I mean, every performance with him was memorable to me, to be honest, just because, I mean, if you had to say, ask me just, out of the blue quickly who's your favorite violence in the world i would definitely say pink superman i just i'd have to how did he how did how was he born i mean you know the you know the saying is his mother must have had an extremely difficult birth because he was born with a violin under his chin and that sort of sums it up doesn't it that someone can have that kind of that kind of innate ability but but you know 
for the students who may be listening to this podcast, I have to tell you that that if you if you go past um, Pankus's room before a performance or whatever, he's practicing scales. Oh yeah, he, he's he's not doing the hard stuff. He's not going up and down the violin showing off. He's doing some very methodical work. It's not necessarily slow, but it, it's it's preparatory work to give his best performance that he can. Yeah, and and I've often wished I could just film that or do an audio thing of it just to say to students you know because who is it who told me a story once with Yasha Haifas I think it was Mr. Gingold who told me the story yes it was Mr. Gingold that that Yasha Haifas was coming to town and the students were just beside themselves oh my god I'm going to hear Yasha Haifas I'm going to hear Yasha Haifas and um, they two two boys decided to rent a room in the hotel right next door to him thinking they were gonna you know they had stacks of repertoire to just da, da, da. well they got there and all they heard was slow practice scales mm-hmm. double stops i love that story mm-hmm. <laughs> how true yeah the basics and when our orchestra got started i know a big part of it was having chamber music as part of what and there were people brought in to, can you speak to some of those early experiences oh they, they i mean the who's who the music world was brought in Jan Starker came. I mean, I, I mean, I played chamber music with the who's who of the music world, thanks to the National Arts Center Orchestra. What other opportunity would I have had to have done that? I mean, name the artist, whether it be Lynn Harrell or Bernard Greenhouse, or I, I just, the names just aren't coming quickly enough, but Raphael Duran, whoever, whoever. I mean, it was just, they all came. I met them all and they all played with us. I mean, we didn't necessarily, I didn't necessarily play in every chamber group um, that they played in, but they came to coach chamber groups too, mm-hmm. not just play in one. So why did that program die? Well, I mean, I think that'd be the most exciting orchestra in the world to be in if that program came back. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, especially for the younger people who are still playing so much chamber music and still like sponges learning all these things. I mean, my goodness, what a, and you know, we, we played with them, not just with the group that they coached, we played with them in, their, in the seats in that circle. I mean, I can't tell you what that was like playing chamber music with, with the greats of the world. Or whoever devised that, Mario Bernardi who did that, that devised that program, I don't even know. And, but there was no good acoustic space, like where were you playing? No. Didn't matter, Leah, yeah. didn't matter. Okay. It, was the, it was the personal experience because we rehearsed in rehearsal room A and B. And I mean, mm-hmm. that's kind of echoey for sure. Yeah. I mean, it, it was always a disappointment when we, when we got to the hall, there's no question because you know it's, it's dull and boring. But having said that, the, the, the words of wisdom, when you, you know, I, I remember all those times just sitting there thinking, that's Janusz Starker playing Dvorak with me <laughs> and just feeling overwhelmed and so grateful for, for that experience and boy I, I tell you though there were there were no lazy no lazy colleagues the ones who signed up to do those chamber work programs they worked their tails off to do the very best and remember we only had a very short period of time to rehearse in because they just came in I think in the last week am I right about that I, I believe so um, I was yeah. just at the tail end of that um, but so, I mean we rehearsed in preparation for it yeah. of course and, and if it was a cello part someone would maybe come in and do the cello part but uh, and we did some with Anton Querdy on piano. I remember doing works with him. I've got to look at my programs and try to remember back to some of those magnificent moments in my life. But I don't know of another orchestra in the world that ever did anything like that. I wonder if we can bring that back. Yeah, it would be amazing. And I, um, another thing that struck me when reading this book about the history, and it makes me so grateful that we have this building and this whole experience, is they, Hamilton Southam had submitted the budget to the government. He knew it'd be very expensive and more than people thought. So there was a separate budget to build the garage and do the excavation and then the garage and then the building was this other budget. So then it was, all these politicians wanted to make a lagoon and just fill just fill in the hole. Did you hear that? I did not know that story. <laughs> it would have just been a parking lot and a lagoon on top. No, but I have it. another Hamilton story to share with you that the world needs to know about. Um, in my brazen, immature way, at the age of 19, I decided I um, 
wanted to go to, um, maybe it was 20, it doesn't matter. I wanted to go to Academia Musical Chigiana in Italy and study. And um, Franco Gulli was the teacher there. And of course he had played with us, I think the year before and everything else. And, uh, you know, I mean, I guess I could have asked for, a, applied for a Canada Council, but maybe I didn't realize that those things were available, I'm not sure. So what happened was I, in my naive way, <laughs> I went up to Mr. Seldom's office <laughs> and I knocked on the door and I said, yeah, please talk to you for a few minutes. And he said, anytime, Elaine, please come in. Sat down his couch and I said, the reason I'm here, because I want to know if um, there's any way I can be sponsored to go to Italy to study. And he said, you want to go in further study? And I said, yes. And he said, what do you want to, you mean violin? And I said, well, yes, it, there's a great music institute there and I want to go study and he said, does it have anything to do with being in Italy? And I said, well, of course, it's a great country with a lot of musical history. And he said, well, then, I'm going to think about this. He called me back um, 15 minutes later. I was downstairs and he said, well, that was, that was easy. And he said, my wife just gave birth to Henrietta Miranda Southam. So in her honor, I'm going to start a scholarship in her name and you're going to be the first recipient. Wow. True, true story. Yeah. So off I went to Italy. <laughs> it was fantastic. For a summer or... Yeah, well, it was it was four weeks for sure, maybe maybe six. I don't recall now. It's been so long. I think it was nineteen seventy. I went or something. No, it wasn't nineteen seventy. It was, gosh, why can I not even remember that? But it was it was amazing. Girana was the um, viola teacher. Girana, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. And Jane Logan went too. And uh, the and um, I had a trio then with Jane Logan and Rosalind Sartori called Trio Chinina because we all went to Italy together to study. And okay. I, my was sponsored, of course, by Mr. Sutton. So to this day, I'm incredibly grateful for him, to him for that. I don't believe that scholarship exists anymore. Yeah. Never heard what of it. Shame. Yeah. Well, if I was independently wealthy, I'd start a scholarship because those, those things are really great for students nowadays. I mean, who can afford to do those kinds of things? It's, yeah. it's, not, it's not attainable. So part of what um, students have to do when they're going into music is get a nice instrument and a good bow. And I'm curious, what kind of advice do you give to them for choosing or when you're trying things out? Well, I have to start this answer by telling the world uh, how very fortunate I was. I mean, my father was a dentist, so we weren't poor, but, you know, we were seven children. He knew diddly squat about violins. He just knew that he wanted us to play the violin. But I remember after our lessons in Toronto, and I would just dread this, he'd go to Heino's in Toronto, which was a famous violin shop, and he couldn't play the violin. He'd just pick it up and go, no, nah, no. Nah. <laughs> but he just was fascinated by violin makers and everything else. So he he would go there, and then he'd go to World, well, World Service. I can't remember what the other one was. Anyway, but he mm -hmm. would just sort of try violins. I don't know what he, why he was trying them because he couldn't play. But I guess he was just fascinated with the idea of having great violins or whatever. And then, um, and then he got in touch with um, someone, someone through New York, I guess. And that's how I became to, um, able to own a Persenda. He bought a Galliano for my oldest sister. He didn't buy me pretty clothes and nice dolls. I never got that, but I got a beautiful violin. <laughs> 1831 Persenda. And he paid $3,500 for it in 1960, which was a hell of a lot of money then. Mm -hmm. And I have a very special bow that's a Tubbs Gold Mount bow that is inscribed on the frog. It says Adelini Patti, Craig Inos. And what that Adelini Patti was a very famous singer, I believe in the 1920s. And she was married to a count. The name of his castle was Craig Inos. So he inscribed this on the... Uh, the frog of the violin and I I'm the proud owner of that bow I also have a beautiful Vion bow I play on very very light bows I, I like to play on 50 58 grams <laughs> mm -hmm. a lot of people don't understand 57 grams one of them a lot of what do you play on there well actually Pink has convinced me to get a, a bow that was tip heavy and um so I have a Michael Van actually because he had one of his bows and then Jessica did and I absolutely okay. love that bow because it is very easy for sustaining because it kind of does the work for you in the upper half, oh. but it's a little harder for, for lighter stuff. So it's the main bow I use. Oh, I'll have to try it. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll want you to try mine too, because even though it feels light, 
it does it does a lot of magic. Yeah. <laughs> But, but back to my question. So when you're advising students, I mean, do you think they should get a bow to match the violin? Um, you know what I mean? No, I'm not an expert on that. I, and I, I know very little about that. Um, I, I, of course, encourage parents to, to do, to buy what they can afford. And um, it's always, it's always a struggle because I mean, nowadays, great violins, you, you're looking at a minimum, of probably 200,000 to start. I don't know. Um, if you're looking at, you know, a Stradivarius or, you know what I mean, that you're getting into multiple, you can get into millions of dollars. So, I mean, I, I don't even know anybody other than Yosuke. And actually, I don't know if you know this, but Yosuke and I both play Presendus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, he, he was an only child. So, and had a father who was a fine musician. So I guess that's why he got lucky as I did. <laughs> um, so with students then, <sighs> It, it's hard. I, I never let a student pick their violin ever. <laughs> um, they don't. They don't get a choice. I just. They. They have no experience, and you know because they're they're fascinated by the color or <laughs> something fancy on the scroll or whatever. So I just sit them down and I say, look, it, you know, I know you want to be part of this, but you just have to trust that I know what I'm looking for. I know how to pair the bow with the actual violin. So. Just, just let me do it. And then you'll learn more as years tick by. Then you can do the same thing for your students. I said, you can be so easily influenced by the color of the varnish. It's something that's not important, you know? Mm -hmm. And especially when you're looking at, I mean, nowadays the students have to look at modern makers. They can't afford anything else. And there are some good modern makers out there. I'm a fan of the modern maker, um, Karen Conta in um, Argentina. Mm -hmm. Uh, trying to think of who it is somebody famous plays on his violins and I can't remember who it is right now sorry <laughs> but uh, Pablo Sanavi who's the concert master of the uh, Buenos Aires Symphony he plays on a number of his violins and I actually took a trip to Argentina to buy the violin and the violin I have is actually a copy mm -hmm. so I paid what twenty thousand dollars for it so that's very affordable to just well it's somewhat affordable to students yeah so that's the advice I give to them but I never let them pick their own <laughs> They, they just don't have any experience. And I mean, we're fortunate to have wonderful places like the Sound Post. You know, he's a very honest and knowledgeable man. And then sometimes I send them to Toronto, to Heidel's and things like that. Mm -hmm. Once who have a little more money, maybe to New York <laughs> or yeah. take a look, take a look at Dericio, <laughs> whatever. So how has your um, teaching changed over the many years, do you think? I think I'm more dedicated. I mean, with every passing year, I, I know something more. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not to say that I wasn't dedicated. I always loved teaching, but, but I learned as much through my years of teaching as my students did. And you as a fine teacher certainly understand what I'm talking about. It's not one recipe for, for all those kids. Everybody's so different. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm a little bit strict as a teacher. When, you know, they come in and they, they want to play. I really, really want to play this concerto. You know, if sometimes I'll let them, you know, play a small excerpt, but I'll say, you know, you're not ready for that. And, you know, it's going to be a struggle and you're going to you're going to end up fighting with your violin. And I said, what's the point of that? Give yourself a little bit more time. And, um, you know, eventually you'll it, it'll happen. But, you know, it's it's hard. Yeah, I mean, it depends. I mean, so many there, you know, they're going to be amateurs and they dream of playing certain things before they leave high school. So. To me, it doesn't, it, it depends, you know, the goal of the student. I have to say that, that, and I don't know if I'm proud of this or, or if I worry about it sometimes, <laughs> but the majority of my students do choose to go into music. And I, I feel very, well, proud of that, I guess, in one way that I was able to inspire them that much. But with the way the world is now, with it being so very competitive, I, Sometimes I've had parents come to me and say, you know, what should I do here? I said, well, bottom line is if they're 18 or 19, they have a dream. And if the dream is strong enough, it's still, they're still young enough to pursue something else if things don't work out. But mm -hmm. if you go into music and you join a fine university, go to a fine university and the, the, the relationships you, you develop through that, the, the people you meet, the, the who's who of the music world, even if it doesn't 
you know, all end up in being your lifestyle. It's still a wonderful, wonderful period of your life. So th that's how I, I kind of leave. Leah, I struggle with this every day of my life because it's so competitive out there now. And I just, I just worry so much. I mean, what do you have to do to, to win an addition? I mean, I think I know the answer to that because I know my excerpts inside out. And I sometimes think that probably my 40 now, I should be an excerpt teacher <laughs> because I just have played these things with so many conductors and have played them all so many times that I really understand and know them well, intimately. It's hard. It's, it's very hard, but I, I don't discourage anybody because you can't let them, let them have their chance. And, you know, they may, they may fall down, but they'll get up and they'll try again. Mm -hmm. Where I do draw the line is, and this is the hardest one for me, and I, I'm sure you'll agree with me. Every now and then, you'll get a student that just works their tail off, and they don't stop. They just, they have this passion and this, this desire to just be the very best they can, but there just isn't a lot of natural talent there. And, and people ask me this question all the time, how important is natural talent? Well. I think it's important. I don't think it's the most important thing. And I don't think that it has to be 100% of the people who succeed. But I think there has to be a little bit of that. Because in my, and this is just my own personal experiences in life, but the students who, you know, have practiced the eight hours a day, who really, where it was really not a natural fit. I'm not sure that was the right thing for them to do in life. Hmm. It's just to be, to be, to take that much of your time as a human being. And I mean, we, you and I know people who practice all day long and we know people who hardly ever practice, but there's, I think there's a happy medium there somewhere. Don't you, that I think there has to be, there are different, there have to be situations where you have to say, now, you know, if this is going to take me five hours to, to, to learn two lines or whatever, I don't know. I mean, either I wasn't taught well how to practice through this. And that's another thing, you know, Students don't know how to practice. I spend a lot of te time teaching students how to practice. It's, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just shocked. At <laughs> they start at the beginning, they go to the end, then they go back to the beginning, go to the end, and they do that a hundred times over. Well, you're just wasting a lot of precious time <laughs> when you could be going for a nice walk. Yeah. So I spend a lot of my time teaching them how to practice properly too. Definitely. And what just to end with, um, what do you think about, uh, like we need more new audiences for orchestra concerts and for classical music in general? What do you think of that going forward with our culture? Well, I think the fault lies with exposure. Mm -hmm. I think it's nothing more than that, actually. I mean, you know, in history is sort of taught us that, that, you know, the concerts and beautiful concert halls, and that was for the privileged few who, you know, who had status in society and all that. Well, of course, that's ridiculous. Music is for everybody. So I think it's very, very important to have um, uh, concerts with uh, a lot of school concerts and a lot of concerts for students who are studying music to somehow bring them into our world a little bit more. Look, at, I mean, I've, I've been at concerts where we have brought audiences in and, um, you know, you look, you look around at that audience and you'll see that spark and in a lot of faces where they never thought maybe they would enjoy and, or they're chatting, sort of goofing around with the kid next to them. Then all of a sudden they just sit by themselves and they're really listening. So I, I, I think that the classical music world has just been too um, isolated and it's just been for the, you know, the gifted or the, the rich or whatever. I mean, from the beginning of time, that's sort of the way it has been. So I think it's very important to go into schools and and reach out to these kids and lots and lots of opportunities like that. I mean, Canterbury is a wonderful school. I'm really glad we have that, but I think we need more schools like that. Trudy, Trudy was doing a wonderful job at um, Lisger too. I can't think of her last name right now. Trudy, mm -hmm. doesn't matter. But, you know, if taking seriously this for, you know, for the school and for, to introduce students to what this was all about. So do you think people who do come to concerts, let's say professionals in their thirties or forties took music as kids? Or I think it's a combination. I think it's a status thing <laughs> for some. Um, I really mean that. I, I, mm -hmm. it's, it looks good to say, you know, I'm going to the 
I'm going to the symphony tonight. Um, but, but having said that, the people who do that initially because it's a status thing, they, they keep going because they, it's something beautiful to do. <laughs> and I had that experience down here in Sarasota recently where I was talking to people and I was asking them that very question, like, you know, how, about the audiences and everything. Uh, you know, will somebody convince them to come to a concert? And they said, I'm not sure I can live without this. <laughs> mm-hmm. And they, they became subscribers. When I talked to Jack Everly last year in season one, um, our principal pops conductor, we talked about doing stuff with movies, which I think is such a great way to get new audiences in. I agree. I think that was a fantastic idea. Mm-hmm. And I mean, the music in those movies is, I, I, I love that kind of music too. <laughs> Some people think that because we're classical musicians on the stage, we only love and understand Beethoven and Mozart. Well, nothing's farther than the truth, of course. But, but I love doing that stuff. <laughs> And the audience obviously loves it. It's something they can relate to, but it's a starting point. Yeah. You know, they start there and then, oh, well, let's broaden our scope and maybe let's try this or that after that. Yeah. I, I, I do worry about audiences. Um, I think it's less, less um, a tradition, shall I say, than it was in years past where these things were passed from family to family. And, well, mm-hmm. My parents went to the symphony, so I'm going to go to the symphony. So... I think we are on the right track in that, you know, we're, we're sending, we're, a lot of us are doing great teaching and, and we're sending, you know, groups into schools, but I think we have to keep doing that. Even if it's just one person in that school, but and I'm not talking about reaching out to them because, you know, we're, we want them to start violin to make them realize that this is something they want to be very much a part of their life all the time, listening mm-hmm. to music, it's something beautiful. It's peaceful. It's restful. It's it's um, inspiring. It's a lot of things. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I, I love being in the audience. I don't know about you, but I love being in the audience and going to concerts. I it's, it's always a real treat for me to do that. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks so much for your time today. It was really wonderful revisiting all these. Well, thank you, thank you, Lay. It was just wonderful to spend this time with you today, and I'll look forward to hearing it and all the other podcasts you're doing. So let me know the schedule. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye. Season one of this podcast had 20 episodes, and season two continues with a really interesting mix of musicians talking about their lives and careers with perspectives on overcoming challenges, finding inspiration and connection through a life so enriched with music. Please follow this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts to be informed about each new episode.